So the last talk of this session is Unconditional Secure Robust Secret Sharing with Compact Shares by Alfonso Chevalos, Serge Fair, Rafael Ostrovsky, and Yuval Rabani. Please go ahead, Serge. Thank you. Thank you, Jens. Thank you to the audience for staying till this uh, last talk of the day. Yeah, this is joint work with Alfonso Cevalos, Rafi Ostrovsky, and uh, Yuval Rabani. As we all know, with the secret sharing scheme, we can split a secret into n shares so that for some parameter t, any t of the shares give no information on the shared secret, and any t plus one of the shares uniquely determine the secret and optimally allow us to recover the secret uh, efficiently. Well-known example is a Shamir secret sharing scheme where the shares are computed as polynomial, inter, uh, polynomial evaluations of a polynomial of degree at most t with uh, the secret as constant coefficient. Here, privacy and reconstructability follow immediately from a Lagrange interpolation. Now here, and in general in secret sharing, the reconstructability requires that the shares are correct, right? However, in a malicious environment where players may be dishonest, this may not be the case. So this motivates the notion of robust secret sharing, where the ordinary reconstructability property is replaced by a robust reconstructability property, which requires that the set of all n shares uniquely determines the secret, even if t of the shares are incorrect. So in robust reconstruction, we take all the shares into the reconstruction, but t of them might be incorrect. Note that I assume the dealer to be honest. If you want to take care of a possibly dishonest dealer, this leads to the notion of verifiable secret sharing. I do not consider this here. An immediate application of robust secret sharing is to secure data storage. Obviously, with a robust secret sharing, scheme, a user can so store sensitive data on a set of servers so that if t of the servers up to t of the servers are corrupt, no information is leaked to the adversary and whenever he wants, the user, he can recover the data from the servers even if the corrupt servers provide rubbish. So it's not too hard to see and I'll say a few words about that in a few minutes. If this parameter, if this threshold parameter t is smaller than n over 3, robust secret sharing can easily be obtained. You can just do plain Shamir sharing and use Reed Solomon decoding in the, in the reconstruction phase. On the other hand, if t equals n over 2 or is even bigger than that, then it's easy to see that robust, uh, robust secret sharing is not possible. Now, in this talk, I'm going to focus on this area in between where robust secret sharing is possible, but it comes at some price. We will have some overhead in the share size, and we'll have to live with a small but positive error probability. So I'm going to consider sort of the extreme case in this range where n is 2t plus 1. I'm going to consider unconditional security, so we do not make any computational assumptions. So what is known about robust secret sharing schemes in this uh, area? Surprisingly little. So there's a well-known scheme by Rabin and Benno, which goes back to 89. Now their scheme has an overhead in the share size of order k times n, I'm sort of ignoring logarithmic uh, factors, where k here is the security parameter and n is the number of players. There is another scheme due to Kramer and myself, which is doing better in, in the overhead, has only an overhead of k plus n, rather k times n. The downside of that scheme is that it's inefficient. The reconstruction is uh, exponential in the number of players, so it's not really useful in practice, if you wish. So our result here is a new robust secret sharing scheme that sort of combines these two positive points of these two schemes into one scheme. So it's a robust secret sharing scheme that has overhead of order k plus n and has efficient sharing and reconstruction procedures. Okay, so this is a further outline of my presentation. First, I'm going to briefly discuss the simple case where t is smaller than n over 3. I'll explain how the Rabin and Benor scheme works. I'll show how our scheme works. And then I'll say a few words about the proof before I conclude. 
So first, a simple case where uh, t is smaller than n over 3, or in the extreme, where n is 3t plus 1. So let's take a Shamir sharing of a secret s, but now t of the shares are incorrect. And of course, we don't know which ones are correct and which ones are incorrect. Now, to illustrate how and why the robust reconstruction works, I'm going to divide these shares into three blocks. So the first block consists of t plus 1 correct shares. By Lagrange interpolation, these t plus 1 shares already determine the sharing polynomial. The second block consists of the remaining t correct shares. So these are sort of t redundant correct shares. And the third block consists of the t faulty shares. Now, read Solomon decoding tells me that if the number of faulty shares is not bigger than the number of redundant shares, then uh, the set of all shares consisting of the correct and incorrect shares uniquely determines the sharing polynomial. And I can even recover it efficiently using Berlikon Welsh algorithm. So this pretty much solves the case, the simple case where t is smaller than n over 3. OK, so now move on to the more tricky case where, sort of in the extreme, n equals 2t plus 1. Now, in the Rabin and Benor scheme, we also have a Shamir sharing of, of the secret. But on top of that, every share comes along with a list of authentication keys and authentication tags with respect to some information theoretic uh, message authentication code. Where the chase tag of the share SI um, authenticates the share SI and can be verified using the ith key that comes along with the chase, chase share SJ. Okay, so the security of the MAC then guarantees that an incorrect share SI will not be consistent with the, with, with, with the authentication keys except with small probability epsilon. Now, there are different uh, choices for such message authentication codes. A uh, common to all of them is that it's easy to see that if you want a narrow probability of 2 to the minus k, then the size of the tags and keys must be at least k bits. Now, because every share, does it work? Can you see it? OK, it doesn't matter. So I mean, because every share comes along with n keys and tags, and every key and tag consists of k bits, we get this overhead of order k times n. <coughs> OK. Um, the reconstruction of the Rapin and Benor scheme, I mean, the idea of the reconstruction is to try to filter out the bad shares and use the good shares uh, with Lagrange interpolation to get the original secret back. Specifically, every share is accepted if and only if it is approved by at least t plus 1 players, meaning it is consistent with the authentication tags of at least t plus 1 players. And then the accepted shares are used with a Lagrange interpolation to compute the secret. Now, it's easy to see that this way the shares of the good players will get accepted and the bad shares of the incorrect players will be rejected with a high probability. Okay, so that's how the rapin benor scheme uh, works. Now I'm going to show you how our new scheme works, and you have to watch very carefully to see what the difference is. Ah, did you see it? There is no difference. So the sharing phase of our new scheme looks exactly the same as the sharing phase of the Rabin and Benor scheme. The only difference that we, is that we use smaller keys and smaller tags. So we reduce the size of the keys and tags essentially by a factor n. And this gives us immediately the, the claimed savings. Now, of course, if I reduce the sizes of the keys and tags, I weaken the security of the MAC. And indeed, in this new scheme, incorrect shares may be approved by some of the honest players with reasonable probability. And then you see that the Rabin and Beno reconstruction fails. So in order to overcome that, we have to come up with a new better reconstruction procedure, which more carefully inspects the, the consistency graph that describes 
which player approves which share. Now, to illustrate uh, how our new reconstruction procedure works, I'm going to discuss an example situation that uh, could occur during the reconstruction procedure. So say that the first share as one is approved by all the n players, then most likely this is correct, we're going to accept it. Now let's say the second share as two is approved, so means being consistent with the authentication keys, uh, by players one up to t plus one, but it is not approved by the remaining t players. Now this could be because the remaining t players are dishonest, so uh, we still have to accept that share. Now say that the third chair, S3, is only approved by the T players, T up to T plus one. Now this means there's at least one honest player that does not approve that chair. Uh, this means that the player three must be dishonest, so we're gonna reject that chair. Okay. Now the important thing to note is that now that we've identified player three to be a cheater, we can actually conclude that also player two must be a cheater. Because the second share was approved by only t plus one players, but in the meantime we've realized that one of these players is actually dishonest. So there must be one honest player that does not approve the second share, and therefore we can conclude that the player two must also be dishonest. Now in the Rabin and Beno reconstruction, they don't take into account this reasoning. Once the share is accepted, that's a done deal, it's accepted. Whereas in our new reconstruction procedure, we take into account this reasoning. And to reconsider accepted shares once we have gained new information on players being uh, dishonest. Um, in other words, sort of the difference between the two reconstruction procedures is as follows. The Rabin and Beno reconstruction accepts every share that is approved by T plus one players. In our reconstruction, uh, we accept every share that is approved by T plus one players with accepted shares. And on top of that, we then use Reed-Solomon Reed decoding on the accepted shares. Formally, the reconstruction looks like this. Uh, things to note are we maintain a set of called good players to start with consists of all the players. When deciding whether we want to accept a share or not, we only count the votes of the players in the set good. Once we realize that the player is dishonest, we kick him out of the set good and we restart deciding which shares to accept and which ones to reject. And as I've said before, we do read Solomon decoding on the shares of the players that end up in this set code. Now the main theorem says that if the MAC is epsilon secure, then our scheme is delta robust, where delta is bounded by this expression here. And the important thing here is that delta is not in the order of epsilon, as is the case in the Rabin and Benor scheme, but it's in the order of epsilon raised to the power, to some power that is linear in n. This then means that we can sort of save a factor n in the size of the keys and the tags, and we still get exponential small error probability. Okay. So as you could see, our new scheme is a very simple and rather natural adaptation of the Rabin and Benor scheme. However, proving the security, so proving this theorem, here turns out to be uh, uh, quite, quite non-trivial. And there are two reasons what, what that, that makes the proof tricky. One reason is that it's not clear what the optimal strategy is for the dishonest players. In the Rabin and Benor scheme, it's quite easy to see that the optimal strategy for the dishonest players is to hand in an incorrect share for every dishonest player. Here in our scheme, it may actually be advantageous for some dishonest player to hand in a correct share. Because such a, what I call a passive cheater, is guaranteed to stay in this set code, and therefore he can support, meaning vote for, the bad shares of his colleague dishonest players. So this means the more such passive cheaters there are, the easier it gets for the bad shares to get accepted because they need fewer votes of the honest players. But the, on the other hand, it also means that more bad shares need to survive because of the Reed-Solomon decoding. 
So there's some trade-off, and it's not clear where, where it's optimal. Now, the other thing that makes the proof trick is there are circular dependencies. Whether a share, as a bad share as I gets accepted or not depends on whether the other bad shares get accepted or not. It depends on whether they get votes from these bad players or not, and vice versa. This means you cannot individually analyze the shares. You cannot individually analyze the probabilities for the sh shares, for bad shares to get accepted and apply union bound, as you do in Arabian and Penor. If you try, you run into circularity. So the proof, in the end, is going to look like this. At least sort of that's the proof that we came up with. First, some notation. I write A and P for the set of active and passive cheaters, and I write H for the set of honest players. And I'll write S for the players that survived the checking phase of the reconstruction procedure. So this S is the set of players uh, whose shares are going to go into the reed solomon decoding. And I use uh, boldface notation for S to indicate that I'm going to treat it as a random variable. Now, because of the reed solomon decoding, it's easy to see that the error probability is given by the probability that more active cheaters survive uh, than their passive cheaters. Because otherwise, the reed solomon decoding is going to take care of the few bad shares that survive. And this also means that uh, we may assume that uh, there are more active than passive cheaters to start with, so the number of active cheaters is more than t over 2. Okay, now we're going to compute or bound this error probability as follows. So first we're going to write this probability as a sum of the probability that exactly L active cheaters survive, uh, where L ranges over the appropriate uh, range. And now we pretty much have to write out what this probability is. And if you think about it, how our scheme works, uh, the probability, or put other way, um, exactly L active cheaters uh, survive if there exists a subset of size L of the active cheaters so that every member of that subset gets sufficient support from the honest players. I mean, if you do it carefully, so you get this uh, lengthy expression here. Now, the thing we have control over is this last part of the expression. We know the probability that the bad share gets accepted, gets approved by an honest player, is upper bounded by epsilon. Now, to, in order to take account of this, uh, uh, this bound, we have to strip off the quantifiers that we have in front of this expression. We can strip off the existential quantifiers by using a union bound. We can strip off the for all quantifiers by noting that the corresponding events are independent. There's another level of existential and for all quantifiers, and we end up with some nasty expression some nasty sum involving binomial coefficients, powers of binomial coefficients. So now we have to get our hands dirty and use some clever rewriting, use some clever bounding, make use of the lower bound on active uh, cheaters that we have, and in the end we get the claimed bound. Now, of course, these uh, last uh, steps are non-trivial. If you want to see the details, you have to look at the paper. Okay, so summarizing we showed the first robust secret sharing scheme for n equals 2t plus 1 with a small overhead in share size, so overhead of order k plus n rather than k times n, as was the case in the Rabin and Binor scheme, and with efficient sharing and reconstruction procedures. The scheme is a simple and a natural adaptation of the Rabin and Binor scheme, but the proof turns out to be non-standard and non-trivial. Now, it's not clear, still not clear, if we can squeeze the overhead down to the proven lower bound, which would be order k. Uh, so far, we have now two schemes that are getting close to it, but both feature a, a gap that is linear in n to the proven lower bound. They both have this linear in n gap, actually for different technical reasons, so it's not clear whether this is uh, inherent or not. That's uh, what I wanted to tell you. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? So there's one there.
Sorry? Linear. Number of construction grounds is linear. Or quadratic. Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, we add the, the, the complexity of the reconstruction phase, right? I mean, you, you go through all the n shares, and whenever you find a dishonest player, you start again, so you get something a, a quadratic in n. Okay. One question. I haven't looked into what's the exact uh, running time, but yeah, I guess uh, so probably n squared plus n times k or something like that. Uh, I mean, nothing uh, huge. Yeah. One question up there. Yeah, so the question was, yeah, more, more detail on the, on, the, on the complexity, on the, com on the computational complexity. And yeah, I haven't looked into optimizing things, but sort of my guess would be around, yeah, quadratic running time. Any further questions? Okay, thank you.